So welcome back to The Lion and the Unicorn, week two. Will we discover who Mick is this week? And why is it so very tough for Lenny at school? What's his secret? And is the lion real? And is Lenny going to get his happy ending, do you predict? Rain back in gear. Do you remember Joyce was scaring Lenny with talk of a lion? And things were pretty terrifying for Lenny at night, lying in his room with all the dark and the shadows. Right. Lenny thought about mum and dad a lot, hoping and hoping they were safe. He longed to see them again. At school, things had got a lot worse. The boys had started to shout things at him and make fun of his name. Lenny Levi, son, are wee wee? They jeered. Wets his bed, don't he? Lenny turned hot with anger and shame. It was true about the bed. Bedwetting, it was such a common thing among evacuees. Remember I mentioned my father, well, he had a real evacuee to stay with him in the and war. he and the evacuee and his sister would have to sleep sometimes under the kitchen table, which was the Morrison shelter. And they'd um, all share a bed sort of tucked in there. And when they woke up in the morning, someone would always have wet the bed. It was all, it was horrible, but it was not surprising. People were so scared and maybe they couldn't get out of bed in the night to go and use the loo. Maybe they thought they were about to be killed by the bombs. It was only sometimes and he didn't think anyone at school knew about it. He guessed that Joyce must have told Nanny them. Nanny was grim faced in the mornings when she had to deal with wet sheets. But Nellie found out and came to Lenny's rescue. Grim faced Nanny. But do you remember which one Nellie is? Who is that checking his hair for Nick? Look, Nellie's the younger one who's friendlier. It says, um, Nellie smiled at him. And do you remember this scene where they were finding out about the family? That was Nellie again. It said that he followed her about the house. So I'm thinking that Nanny, and they mentioned this other lady, Mrs B, are looking after his physical needs, but they're not really loving him or caring about him or looking after his emotional needs. So thank goodness for Nelly. What does she do to help him solve it? You can beat this Lenny, she told him. Everyone does in the end. She smuggled some spare bedclothes into the attic so that Lenny could put them on before Nanny came in the morning. She whisked away wet sheets and washed them herself and she lent Lenny her big alarm clock. Lenny set it twice in the night and it with a great off. clang, but the girls never woke up. <laughs> Thank goodness. Do you get the alarm clock thing? So that if his bladder's full but he hasn't realised, then when the alarm clock wakes him up, he can nip to the loo. The bed wetting got better, but the boys at school went on teasing. One afternoon, Mick came across Lenny sitting hunched on a bench in the walled garden and politely failed to notice his red-rimmed eyes. Do you get it? So basically, Lenny's been crying and Mick isn't mentioning it. Homesick? he asked. At first, Lenny was too upset to answer. Then he blurted out all about what the boys at school had said. It's not even true anymore. Well, hardly at all. But I don't suppose they'll ever stop saying it. I used to wet my bed when I was your age, Mick told him. It was when they sent me away to boarding school. Mm, interesting little bit of info there. If he's gone to boarding school, he's not very likely to be a servant. The rich people who went off to get a wonderful education. Had you done something wrong? asked Lenny. No, they thought it would do me good, said Mick. My father went there. It was awful. I got teased all the time. Then it started again when I was in hospital after... He looked down at where his leg had been. But you were grown up then, said Lenny, amazed. I love his honesty. Yes, I cried a lot too, but I got through it somehow. And so will you, or my name's not Mick DeVass. <gasps> da, 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 big reveal. There was a long silence. Lenny stared at Mick. You're the war hero, he said at last. You've got medals for bravery. Nelly told me. There he is. Portrait of him. What was it Nelly said exactly? They've got a lot of soldiers in the family. Lady de Vassy's husband was killed fighting in the First World War and her son's a war hero. He's got medals and all. 
There we are. That's our Mick. I was frightened all the time in the fighting, said Mick. But I suppose you can't be brave if you're not frightened in the first place. My father was really brave, a fine officer. I'm only a private. My dad's a private, said Lenny proudly. He's fighting the Germans like you did. I've got his badge. I never wanted to fight Germans or anyone else, Mick told him. It's cruelty, bullying and oppression we're fighting against. Lenny was not quite sure what this meant, but he got the general idea. I used to come here to this garden to see the unicorn when I was a boy in the school holidays, said Mick. I used to long to be brave and manly and all the things they wanted me to be. But there are different kinds of courage. And I'll tell you one thing. The boys who say those things to you haven't got much. None at all, in fact. Later, when he was alone, Lenny thought a lot about what Mick had said. Gradually, the bedwetting stopped altogether. Knowing a real war hero who had had the same problem helped. He even forgot about prowling lions. But then something happened, which was much worse. Mum's weekly letters stopped coming. Every morning, Lenny waited anxiously by the gates for the postman to arrive, but there was nothing for him. He told nobody how worried he was, but he started to have bad dreams about searching for Mum and running and running and lions leaping out at him and pinning him down with their horrible teeth and claws. Have you noticed how the picture is laid out on the page and the lion in the statue it looks like it's directly in eye contact with the unicorn over there. Nice metaphor. The bedwetting started again. In the end, everything was just too terrible to be born. That kind of born is like when you can't bear it. Not like babies getting born, because it's got an E on the end. Too terrible to be born. Prediction moment. What's he going to do? One night... Lenny waited till the girls were asleep. He had his suitcase ready packed. He put his precious badge in his pocket and crept downstairs to the back kitchen. It was difficult to unbolt the back door without making a noise, but he managed it, standing on a chair. He was running away. He had to get back to London. He planned not to go by the main drive, which went round the front of the house in case he was seen. Instead, he would cut through the gardens into the orchard, that's where the apple trees are, through a hole in the hedge and across the field to the road. There was a bright moon. Lenny's sharp shadow tracked him nimbly along the silent path. In the vegetable garden, he scampered past raspberry beds and rows of staked up runner beans where anyone or anything could be hiding. What's he thinking? When he reached the orchard, he broke into a run, weaving from one tree trunk to another, crouching low over his suitcase. When he reached the hedge, he stopped short. He thought he heard something moving stealthily and carefully through the grass on the other side. He listened. The whole night seemed to be breathing, purring, growling. He was sure something was coming through the hole in the hedge. Then he did not stop to find out what it was. He dropped his suitcase and ran. Now the dark, many-chimneyed shape of the house seemed to be flying swiftly against the moon, too far away to run to now. But he ran all the same, wildly, until he was heaving for breath. Now he was on the path by the summer house. He saw the door to the walled garden. He pushed it open, fell inside and slammed it shut behind Lenny him. Lenny was crying now, but he felt safe. The garden was completely quiet. The rose bush was frozen in the moonlight. Underneath, in its dense shadow, something glowed softly. It moved gently. Lenny wasn't frightened. He went towards it, and at that moment he saw the unicorn. It was alive, glimmering under the rosebush, sitting on its haunches with its one spiralling horn and its long, white, silky mane. It turned its beautiful neck and looked at him. Lenny knelt down. He laid his head between its hooves with his, with his face in the grass. He was very tired. Almost at once he fell, as though from a great height, into a deep sleep. He woke up with the sun hot on his neck. 
It was morning and the unicorn had gone. The statue was in its usual place, watching over the garden. Then he got up and looked round. He knew that something had changed inside him. It seemed now that it was his own night fears which had been chasing him. He went out of the garden, closing the door softly behind him, and began to walk back to the house. The lion and the unicorn were back inside Lenny's head and on his badge. But one important thing was real, and that was what the unicorn stood Different for. Different kinds of courage, Mick had said. Now, after last night, Lenny thought he really knew what that meant. Perhaps with his new unicorn courage, he would try to stick things out for a bit, see if they got better. Anyway, he didn't seem to care much what Joyce and the rest of them said or did any more. They were only a load of mean, mangy old cats after all. Maybe that's why she drew the lion so ugly. Lenny came to where the garden met the back drive. As he turned the bend, he saw a figure coming towards the house from the opposite direction. A smallish person in a brown coat, a familiar walk. There was a good distance between them. Lenny quickened his pace. Then he broke into a run. Who is it? Now, as he got closer, the outline of that person was blurred with tears. Lenny tore the last few yards. Mum! Oh, Mum! He shouted, and he threw himself into her arms. Didn't you get my letter? said Mum after a while. Bombed out. A direct hit. The whole house gone. Lucky I was working at the canteen that night. I've got no letter, sobbed Lenny. The letterbox must have got it, said Mum. I was running away, Lenny tried to tell her, but then... His voice choked. It was too difficult to explain. Lucky you didn't, said Mum, or we might have missed each other. You're a brave boy, Lenny. A proper hero you are. After you left, it seemed like even bombs would have been better than us being separated. But now I've come to take you away. We're going to your Auntie Rachel's in Wales. It's by the sea, Lenny. And guess what? Your dad's coming home on leave. We'd better go and tell them. Lenny felt in his pocket to check that his badge was safe. So he, Lenny Levi, was brave after all. He knew that didn't mean he would never be scared again, but at that moment he felt he could face anything. Jaunty now, and hand in hand with Mum, he walked towards the house. Yay! Happy ending! And the kind of happy ending where you're just completely rescued from the situation rather than gradually learning to make friends and gradually getting used to it. Finding your courage and growing as a person. No, nope, this is a complete way. Fairy godmother. Totally out of the situation. Happy ever after. OK, question one. How did the boys at school know that Lenny was wetting the bed? How did they find out? Question two. How did Nellie help Lenny solve his bedwetting problem. What did she lend to him? Okay, question three. What was the word to describe how Lenny was sitting on that stone bench when Mick came across him and they had that consoling conversation? It said he'd been crying and he was sitting... What was that adjective? Question four. When Mick was talking to him about his life... Can you remember why Mick first started wetting the bed when he was a child? And the last one's the tricky one. Is the lion real? And whether or not it's a real actual lion, what is it a metaphor for? OK, pause the video if you need more time, because now I'm going to do the answers. Right, the first one. How did they find out about the bed wetting at school? Did you get that? It was Joyce. He guessed that Joyce must have told okay, them. Okay, question two. They solved the bedwetting. Nellie helped him. She lent him her big alarm clock. Do you remember? She, he set it twice in the night and it went off and that helped him pop to the loo and not have his Gosh, accident. Really? That is nocturnal enuresis. So now you know. Right. Question three was, how is Lenny sitting? And the answer Here he is... The answer is... Hunched. There we are, sitting hunched with his shoulders up and his head down and his back kind of so curved. question four. Mick said he was wetting, he started wetting the bed when he was a child when he got sent away to boarding school. 
Okay, so again, it was like a massive house move away from his parents. A kind of stress reaction to his whole life being completely uprooted. So now we come to that tricky question, the lions, or lion. You can see here it's hinted at with the claws Whatever of the bark. Have been killing rabbits in the vegetable garden? Is it a fox? Is it a big cat? Is it one of those feral wild cats that's kind of like a domestic cat, not big like a lion? Look at Joyce looking slyly. She's delighting, filling him with fear. Look, so it could be a real lion escaped from the zoo. And then look how she's deliberately terrifying him. Lions kill people. They wait in the dark and spring out at you and tear your stomach out. Wow. There is that shadow of the lion in his room and the noise outside. There's that statue there. And of course the dreams when he's all anxious about his mum, about a lion. Where was it? Leaping lions, leaping out at him and pinning him down with their terrible teeth and claws. So is it just his anxiety and fears? Is it the kind of metaphor for them? He has this terrified bit in the night. Strong hints there. He thought he heard something moving stealthily and carefully through the grass on the other side of the hedge. Whole night seemed to be breathing, purring, growling. He's left it open-ended. Oh, look, could you see that lion? Did you notice that before in the picture, that, that lion shadow? And look, those trees look like lion's claws. Does that mean it's all in his mind, exaggerating the scary things around him? And then, when he's being comforted, comforted by the unicorn in that magical passage, it seemed now, or was that? just a dream. It seemed now that it was his own night fears which had been chasing him. Here's the part that's not to do with shadows and dreams and fears. Um, talking about Joyce and the others, they were only a load of mean mangy old cats. Remember a lion is in the cat family? It's like a big cat some people call them. So do you think that they're the real lions in this? The people who are trying to harm him? So I'd love to know how you answered that question. So we've got the lion in this book for all things negative and the unicorn helping him feel brave even though he's scared and understand there are different kinds of courage and find his courage and feel okay. Okay, I was thinking what new words, what new vocabulary to that you might want to learn today from all that. And I noticed at the very end, did you see here that word jaunty? how Lenny was walking. So jaunty, that's J-A-U-N-T-Y. Can you see that? Yeah, jaunty, that basically means cheerful. Okay, so Lenny's walking along cheerfully with his mum. It's kind of slightly cheeky. So um, I might have a hat and I might wear it at a jaunty angle. Let's try. So here, I've got my hat on normally and now it's at a jaunty angle. It's a bit okay, of a size. Working through the book, the word pedestal, that's the thing that the statue stands on. So the unicorn, when it was being magical in the night, was down on the ground comforting him. And then in the morning, it was back on its pedestal, this sort of block that supports it. See it better in this picture. It's often quite high up. It's a kind of tall thing that the statue stands on top of to sort of raise it up in the air. Sometimes they talk about putting people on a pedestal. If you really look up to them and admire them. So you spell it. Can you see that all right? Ped is Latin for foot. So if you think of pedestrian, it means you walk on foot, or pedometer, or even pedal of a bike. So I suppose the statue puts its feet on the pedestal. So ped, s, and then it's not two L's of tall, it's just one L. Pedestal. Maybe you can think because it makes it tall. Pedestal. Okay, so um, you could say that you used to put this pop star, this celebrity, this vlogger on a pedestal, but then one day they really let themselves down uh, and they fell off their pedestal. Or you're, you might write a story and your statue comes to life and in the morning it's just back being a statue again, back on its pedestal. Okay, you remember when Lenny was creeping around in the garden in the night and it said, he heard something moving stealthily and carefully. Do you know stealthily? Stealthily. St -E -A. There was a ride at Alton Towers called Stealth, I think. Stealth means secretly, quietly. So stealthily, if you're creeping downstairs in the night to get a slice of chocolate cake, like Michael Rosen, 
you'll be trying to walk stealthily okay um lovely adverb describing how you're walking so you're doing it secretly so what should we do let's have somebody tiptoeing going shh with their finger on their lips and they're just putting their toe down really carefully they're about to step on a bit of lego so they're walking stealthily along the corridor it's secretly and quietly and they don't want anyone to hear them so it's a bit like healthily we're eating healthily but we've got this st at the front look at or you could think of it like it's got the word steal because if someone's going to steal something they might well be walking stealthily creeping in to get it i walked stealthily down the stairs and kind of partners with this is the word nimbly ah oh, now where did that come in the story let me just find it here we go um it's when he's creeping out at night and it says the shadow can you see the shadow tracked him nimbly along the silent paths it means nimbly is the adverb of nimble um if you're nimble do you know in football training or in pe when you have to do that exercise where you you run into and you put your foot into each of the tires these are like rubber tires laid out on the floor and you run and you put your foot into each one of them really quickly that's your nimble oh, we used to have a funny old nursery rhyme that goes jack be nimble jack be quick jack jumped over the candlestick and it was if you could jump over this little candlestick um, without setting fire to your nightcap you were so nimble stealthily and nimbly are both really good adverbs they're both ways of running you could run stealthily you can run nimbly okay last one is grim faced so um you can imagine happy faced you can tell how the person will be feeling. Grim-faced. Do you remember it was Nanny who was grim-faced when she saw that Lenny had wet the bed and she had to deal with his wee-wee sheets? So grim-faced. Grim is something that's really difficult and depressing and horrible. And um, if you're feeling grim, you might be feeling really poorly and wretched and miserable. And if someone's grim faced, they would be, you wouldn't want to run up to them for a hug. You would maybe um, step back and feel worried That's and scared. A bit gloomy to end on. So I just want to squeeze in, blurted out. They said Lenny blurted out all his problems. Um, so he's not explaining them in a calm rational organized way he's going to have a foot you can imagine maybe a toddler who's um all their words are just coming out in a tumble and then and then he pushed me and then i fell over and then i hurt my finger he blurted them out so he's been all upset or worried or scared and now it's all over and he's explaining it to a big kind listening person and he's blurting out all his problems and um this person's patiently listening oh, i said he didn't i let's give him a pair of trousers oh, let's give him lots of speech bubbles because it's not all coming out neatly it's coming out in a muddle right there's our words for today Jaunty, pedestal, stealthily, nimbly, blurted out, grim-faced, and I hope you have a really good week and a fantastic half-term.